Hello, everyone. I'm waiting just a few minutes to let some participants enter the room. I see them slowly coming in. Uh, so I want to give them an extra minute or two just to allow some latecomers the ability to get in. Hello everyone, good evening. Welcome to the CAD platform tonight. I am Kavita Pipalia. I'm the CAD president. I'm thrilled to be here this evening with you. Before we proceed and get started with the panel, I'd like to share the ground rules. For those of you who've already registered in Zoom and are in the room, you are allowed to participate in the Q&A. If you take a look at the bottom of your screen, there is the icon there to put your questions in. You can always raise your hand and be spotlit so that you can sign your question or comment if you choose. Thirdly, for when the panelists are on screen, we are not going to allow crosstalk. Please respect their space on the platform. And we would like for all of you to attend to their message. Next, we are not going to accept or tolerate any uh, offensive comments or criticisms. We will remove you from this Zoom. For those who have not registered, you can watch the live streaming on Facebook and on YouTube. You can put your messages into the chat box there. We do have moderators keeping an eye on the chat box in YouTube and Facebook and will relay your messages to the panel as behind the scenes members. And they will share some of the comments or questions from the live streaming viewers. And we will take those questions or comments and share them with the full audience. We have a planned break in between um, our questions. We wanna give them our planned questions, give a break, and then allow the floor to open up for questions and answers. Now, please remember to give a slight one or two seconds, maybe to just take a breath so that the interpreters have opportunity to switch maybe uh, alternate the spotlight. So please be just mindful and give a little moment or two to just take a breath and allow a smooth transition. So without further ado, <clears throat> I want to welcome the amazing panel we have here tonight. We are here to talk about the interconnected nature of American, uh, of American Asian American experiences. And this is group B because we had group A two weeks ago, which was phenomenal. And so we have group B who is going to share with you tonight. So I would like to welcome them. So I'm going to ask them to turn their cameras on. Hello everyone. I am so excited to have you here with us this evening. I appreciate you joining our panel. It is an honor to have all of you here. I will pose the first question for you. So we, the title of this is The Interconnected Nature of Asian Experience. So we're here to have you share your journeys with the viewers. First, we're going to have each of you introduce yourselves. And I wanna start with Jenny first. Hello, my name is Jenny Nihon. I am a deaf blind Filipina. I was born in the Philippines, but I moved to America at the age of one. I grew up in Filipino culture, Filipino family, et cetera. As far as race and ethnicity, I identified as Filipino. 
My pronouns are she and her. I have a bachelor's degree from CSUN, a master's degree in counseling from Gallaudet University. I'm employed with a nonprofit agency for the deaf and hard of hearing, the Tri-County GLAD, TC GLAD. Thank you. Next. Hello, my name is Jan Wong, and this is my sign name. My pronouns are he and his. I was born in Hong Kong. I moved to the United States when I was eight years old. And I grew up um, learning oral approach. I didn't learn ASL until I was 14 and I was in a mainstream program. I never attended a deaf school. I'm married and I currently work as an ASL professor at a campus. My previous job uh, was uh, with the state and, and the county and I've been teaching for 15 years at UCLA. UCLA. Thank you. Namaste. Hi, my name is Sarita Faki. This is my name, fine. And my pronouns are she and her. I am deaf since the age of two. I was born in Western India in the city of Mumbai and then raised on the east side of India in Kolkata. I identify myself as Indian, as far as India from South Asia. I was educated in a oral school program with other children. I did graduate and went to community college with other hearing students for two years. And I worked at my school as a teacher my father did send me eventually to Gallaudet University to complete my schooling. And once I got to Gallaudet, I was 25 years old. Currently, I work in the local government agency of Schaumburg Township in the Deaf Services Coordination position. And so I advocate and I've been doing that for 29 years. Thank you. Morning. Hello, hello. Hello, my name is Onha Park. I was born in Seoul, Korea. And I migrated to the United States when I was 29 years old, which was six years ago, 2014. I first attended Ohlone College and I was a student there for actually five years. My major was criminal justice. The reason I moved to the United States because in Korea there's very there's limited access for deaf people as well as the LGBT community. I am a transgendered person, and that is one of the reasons I moved here to the United States. Currently, I am employed at Toolworks, and that company. Let me explain what they do. They have it's a very deaf positive um, approach with the people working there. I've worked there for several years, a year and a half now. And also um, I do a lift. Um, I work in the Bay Area uh, as a driver, picking up clients, interacting with them. I'm also the Bay Area, um, it's called Bay Area Association of Asian Deaf, and I'm the president. So it's very nice to meet all of you. Wow, I am absolutely thrilled to have you on our panel. I bet you've got wonderful stories to share. So my next question for the panel is when you moved to the United States at whatever age you were, what differences did you notice between the United States and your originating country? What areas did you struggle and where did, did you succeed? So please raise your hand before you speak. Thank you. So open the floor to whoever is willing to volunteer. This is Arita. So all of my life, 
I was in India with my family. I, I lived in the traditions and the cultures, the foods, and I saw a lot of the same people and had no difficulties. We had the same skin color, maybe a little bit of variance, but for the most part, similar. And then once I moved to the United States, I went to Gallup University. Wow, what a difference. There were black, white, Asian, uh, Latinx, Indian, and gay, lesbian, just something that I was not used to. And I didn't know sign language when I moved here. Uh, the diversity was tremendous. You had signers and orals because some signed quickly, some were slow, some finger spelled. And so um, my exposure was an extreme culture shock and it was quite frustrating. But over time, you know, I really wanted to be a part of the community. I wanted to make friends and I did struggle to make friends. A lot of people turned me away because I was different. You know, I wore Indian clothing and they looked at me very differently. And it was, it was a frustrating experience for me. Um, I did find a group of Indian people. It was a small group, but they were very helpful for, for my experience. And eventually I moved to Chicago. I did get married and my husband and I moved to Chicago for work. And once again, I struggled, you know, I had to make new friends, I had to meet new people, and uh, I decided to participate in a bowling league. And I thought hopefully I could make some friends there, but they were all Caucasian. And that was a bit awkward and something I needed to get used to. I did try to make friends, but they kind of looked at me, asked a bunch of questions, where are you from, what school did you go to, what college? And when I said Gallaudet, they kind of shied away from me. And uh, I feel like, you know, they expected that I would be very arrogant and so forth coming from Gallaudet. But, you know, many of them knew each other because they attended the same school. They were part of the same club. And I was an outsider. That was a big struggle for me in order to just try to make friends. Once I started working with the Deaf Services as a coordinator, then I started seeing, you know, connections being made with some of my clients. And now I've got very, very good friends. It just took a really long time before I could make those kinds of connections and that people would accept me for who I am. Next. As I mentioned before, I was born in the Philippines and at uh, one, you know, of course, at age one, you can't remember anything. That's when I moved to America. Now, again, I was born deaf. So, and my brother is deaf as well. But my parents didn't know what to do with two deaf children. So they decided to relocate to the United States. For a better education, they thought it would be best for the two of us. We had kind of did the oral approach first, lip reading, and then we went to a mainstream program which um, taught, they used the total communication method. And then they tried the school for the deaf in Riverside, 50 Riverside. But truthfully, did I truly understand Philippine culture? Um, no, I, I actually struggled. My parents would take me to their various um, organizational events and their cultural events. And there was, of course, parties and games and so forth at these events. And I went there and I didn't always understand because they were all hearing people. Now I would see, of course, the food and I would eat that food, but I didn't always understand the organization and the kind of the meaning behind it. I would fly to the Philippines maybe four times or so. And um, again, they all looked like me. And when in public, when I was signed, I would get these stares. Uh, I wasn't sure what was wrong with that, but I did see those people staring at, at me. My parents were strong advocators of sign language. So they did um, is take me to different places. Like when I went to a cafe, I was signed, people would just look. The, and I was so stunned because it was a deaf principal. And I was amazed. I was just a seven or eight at that time. And that's when I first got an understanding of what it was to be deaf. And I came back to the United States. And I thought, you know, I don't have any really Filipino role models. So uh, and that was a real struggle as far as that cult part of myself. Maybe two or three, a few Asians, but that was about it. It was very limited as far as the Asian exposure. That, however, is when I finally, I finally started to find my identity. And that was through the Asian deaf um, 
in San Francisco, San Francisco is an Asian Deaf Aid Association. Um, and I made some friends there and it was just three of us. Uh, we went to see Sun together. I don't think um, I was, you know, really proud to be Asian at that time. I kind of took it for granted and just kind of was a normal student, college student. I still had some kind of interpersonal struggles with my Asian identity, but I started to discover that, you know, um, I think I'm still on a journey of self-discovery, who I am as an Asian individual, as a person, and still learning. Um, I'm a deafblind Filipina, and this is a journey that I'm still um, self-searching and self Revelation. This is Jan. You know, similar to Jenny and Sarita, it seems like our story is very similar. When I relocated to America, the reason was because in America, there was a lot of important issues. You know, in moving here from Hong Kong, I was not born deaf. I was born hearing and became deaf at the age of five due to getting a meningitis. It's a, it's a complicated uh, spinal uh, illness, so known as MS. So I was very, very ill and lost my hearing. They thought perhaps it would be temporary and my father was stunned. By the age of eight, my father decided to move to the United States because he was looking for employment. And my um, my stepmother brought me here with her to the United States and wow, I was not used to this. I was seeing so many different people with different kinds of hair and I, I was used to the same color dark hair and the same color skin and the same culture being in Hong Kong. And once I came to America, I had to deal with blonde haired people. I have to deal with red haired people and people with darker skin, I thought, oh my gosh, do I have to paint myself every day so that I could have fit in? No, I could just be myself. And I did grow up in an oral program. I knew no sign language until I was the age of 14 when I went mainstreamed into a public school. I did learn the alphabet because I watched two deaf girls that rode on the bus with me every day. And I wanted so much to sign. The first thing I did was I would try to mouth to them, can you tell me? And the deaf girl, she was giving me the alphabet. And so I, oh, I was so thrilled. I came home, but I wouldn't sign because I knew my parents wanted me to speak. They forced me to speak. And I, I was uh, mandated to learn how to speak because they believed that's a way for me to survive in society. And that if I was functioning as a deaf person, having a disability, that it would be a barrier. Now I realize that would have never happened. I could have learned both to speak and sign, and it would not have been an issue. I could still function as a citizen. I can walk. I can get a job. I can go to college and graduate. I graduated from California State University Fresno with a degree in human services. And I love working with people. So it was ideal for me. And then over the years, I did get my master's in science at Capella University, which is an online school. I graduated in 2014. Woo, that was a long road for me to get this degree, but uh, it was still exciting nonetheless. I do still struggle as an Asian. I do not acknowledge myself until someone, our friend and classmate named Sharon, kind of brought me into the first Asian meeting. And I found that to be quite wonderful and very exciting to continue my journey as an Asian person. I was born in Korea and that's where I was raised and I was raised in Seoul. And I was born deaf. My first um, was approach to education was learning to speak and to talk, not sign language. My parents, all my family are hearing and they don't know Korean sign language even today. So they would just teach me the world method. We'd lip read and speak. 
Um, I was about six or seven, then my identity, I believe my gender identity started to be, I was confused. So which am I male, am I female, am I deaf? Um, outside, I, I went to a mainstream program and I was the only deaf person there. There was a hearing person there with a disability, they had autism. So it was just the two of us in this public school. And all, everyone else was uh, just a regular public students and they kind of shunned us. So it was just me and this other disabled, um, student. The teachers were that way as well. I, I think they too kind of just, you know, stuck with the hearing students and did not include us. It was not very inclusive. So we were often separated. I, this didn't bode well with me. Um, the teacher was hearing and during, you know, at classroom times, you know, the students, I would say there's probably about 35 students and we were set in rows and the teacher would sit in the back. Of course, I could not hear or because I couldn't lip read the person. I couldn't see them move their mouth. I couldn't hear them. So, and there was no interpreting services. So I just had to lip read people the entire time. When I took tests, I'd have to listen and try to um, write it. I get, sometimes I get only zero or 10. I never got a very good score. I never got hundred um, percent. I never was able to get, achieve that A. So for those years, in school, I felt very limited. I would say about 20%, most of the rest of 80% was totally um, something I lost out on. I would read a lot. Um, that's actually was the thing I did the most is just read. In elementary school, I finally graduated and I was transitioned to middle school as well as high school. And there was a deaf school. They had, um, when I went there, there was, um, I heard that there was deaf students they signed. My parents didn't want me to go there. They want, and the hearing teacher didn't want me to go transition to this deaf school as well. But I said, no, I'm gonna do it for one year. I really fought and I, for this right to go there. No one really helped me or supported me to go to the deaf school, but I was determined I was gonna do that. <clears throat> so my mom asked the teacher and I was advised, I ignored their advice and I went ahead and applied to the deaf school. My parents, uh, she was afraid that if I went to the deaf school, then what would happen is that I would not, I would lose more oral skills those, and I would just sign rather than speak. But I felt that was my decision. I was very adamant about this and I wanted to be happy. I felt that this is information and this is um, the place I wanted to go. I wasn't getting information at the other program. So I went there at the deaf school. And then I, I moved to America. Here, it is very different than Korea. United States, my, it's a, amazing. Um, it's very big, United States is. There's uh, various cultural cu cultures. There's Asians of various countries. There's Caucasians and different, um, all kinds of different races and nationalities. And rights are, um, there's entitlement here where in Korea, it's very limited. You have here, you have gay and you have um, deaf and hard of hearing, you have many rights and civil groups um, that social justice is more prevalent here. Now, more importantly, I feel as an Asian person, as a deaf person, I want education. I want to continue my education. Very good. I think, you know, you see the common uh, differences are education, rights, and, you know, parents thinking that they know what's best for your future. You know, they want you to get employment. They want you to have education and to have your rights. I think that's kind of standard. Um, so the next question. The older generation, the idea of saving face is very rooted in the Asian tradition. It's part of our culture and there's so many different movements uh, like Black Lives Matter or uh, the pandemic or hashtag stop Asian hate. You're seeing more and more Asian people slowly letting go and sharing their feelings and thoughts. So I want to know, do you believe that the concept of saving face is starting to fade away or do you think it still exists with the current generation and why or why not? Who would like to start? Please raise your hand first. Anyone? I believe 
that notion of saving face still does exist currently. And it has been passed down. Passed down. I, of course, in the generations prior, more so. And the reason why I say that it's still uh, prevalent is because um, but I think that, you know, there's right now, it was more so back then. Now there's more direct communication and more saying for your rights. But you see pockets of people and groups, you notice that um, they're standing up. And the reason why is because it's based on culture. For example, in my um, in Filipino culture, my mother is very strong. She's very outspoken. And so I've seen that. And that's not saving face, that it doesn't, you know, really congeal with that idea of saving face. So it's giving me a pause to think. And I think to myself, I go, I kind of look inward and I don't feel that, you know, I need to apologize or need to save face. Now, when the, there's the right time and the right topic, then I'm ready to have a discussion. I uh, no, you know, any kind of, you know, holding back. So the idea of saving face, I believe is in some groups, maybe perhaps even some individuals. As a whole, that is something I would have to think about if it's truly prevalent with all Asian groups. And this is Jan. I agree with Jenny. I think the concept of saving face has multiple meanings. When you look at what parents and they believe in their generation, I think with the 21st century that we live in and the new millennials, especially Asian millennials, they're more likely to stand up and speak out and say, this is enough. I think it's allowed them to flourish. They're saying it's about time that the world needs to change. We're far more advanced than we ever were. And this is something to really consider this, this notion of saving face. What's the purpose of it? Do we keep things to ourselves? Is it shameful? What defines us as who we are today? And it should not be based on fear. We should be able to stand up and speak our truth and allow others to understand without being looked at negatively as an Asian group of people, especially saying, oh, well, yeah, you're good at education, but that I think is a a misunderstanding you know we have many other roles that have uh resulted positively and i think we really need to define ourselves and the notion of saving face because oftentimes we have to educate folks and and provide that balance and not always just keep within our own but to balance you know have that checks and balance so i do agree with jenny I'd like to give a few examples. Because in the past, I think I would very much kind of um, accept what's going on, the status quo and bite my tongue. You know, but with Asian hate crimes, I decide, you know, this is this is where uh, you cross the line. So let me give you a few examples. So my name is Sarita. And P many people say, Sarah, they go, uh, they all different, uh, Every, it, all different um, versions of my name except my name. Um, and I'm Indian, so come on, I say, you know, so many years and they're still mispronouncing my name. You should know my name by now. It's pretty easy and I explain it. It's really like Rita. And then you just add S-A in the beginning. It's pretty simple. And people say, oh, okay, okay. But still they mispronounce my name and I get Sarah, I get all kinds of uh, variations of my name. So I'm repeatedly telling people and actually fighting for people mispronouncing my name correctly. And I'm able to memorize everybody else's name. Why can't people remember not my name? So I feel it's about time. The second example I want to say, um, the head shaking. You know, though in India, it's a cultural thing and it's something I'm used to. It's very common in India to see that. And then when you come to the United States, people would laugh and kind of mock me because of this. Um, but it's part of my culture. I didn't think twice about it. So that's something I had to feel like I had to hide. I had to change this movement that it was culturally bound. So when I came to Chicago, I started starting it again with, I started this kind of movement of my head with uh, people in the same culture because we all shared that. 
But when friends would come along, American friends would come and enter our group, they would see this and they started making fun of it. I said, wait a minute, you know what? This is tied to my culture. And I thought, you know, let it go. Don't get upset about it. It's, but it's time to stop this. It's time for them to stop, you know, noticing this. It's like Italians maybe have a certain gesture they do and we respect them. Well, why could you respect us for our particular body movement or our gesture? The other thing I would talk about is food. People will smell our food and they go, oh my goodness, that smells awful. It smells, you know, and, but the food is, it's food. Or maybe, um, but just by the smell, people were be offended. One woman, I'll have to tell you, she's a white woman. She was, there's a sweet kind of food from India. And I said, here, try this, just try it a little bit. And she ate it and she threw it on the floor. I don't think that's not acceptable to do that. If you don't like something, I understand that, no problem, but you don't throw it on the floor. You know, you don't throw it out, you spit it out of your mouth. I was, it's like, whoa, that really made me sad when she did this. So I think it is time for people to accept us. You know, they people have other uh, food, people are vegetarians, they don't eat meat. I accept that. I'm tolerant of that and respectful. So I think we have to have mutual respect about um, and that people should respect like each other's culture and generation. Is that too much to ask? Just for mutual respect. This is one half. So based on what Sarita just shared, I do agree about the foods. You know, I've had an experience with Korean with the kimchi, which is uh, marinated cabbage. And that's something that, you know, Korea is famous for as a vegetable dish, but you know, it can be helpful in preventing cancer and other illnesses. And I think we eat it in, in the culture 365 days of the year. And I have two containers of kimchi at all times. I have to have them. Um, I've had people come, you know, and they see that and they say, what is this awful smell? And I have to pause and think, you know, do we need separate refrigerators? Do I need a mini refrigerator to put my own food my kimchi in or are we going to just respect each other's space and share it and it's about you know being comfortable in my space and if they're going to complain about my food smelling funny that was very uncomfortable for me and then going into the korean market you know you can buy all these different items and while you're in the car you know in the trunk and uh we you know doing our shopping and whatnot and a couple of my friends says, oh, my gosh, if the car smells funny, let's open up the windows. And uh, that, that, you know, really struck me. Um, a few times I would not buy kimchi knowing this because I didn't want to be put in an uncomfortable situation where I'm being disrespected. I finally did decide to move out and find other roommates. My previous roommates, I asked, hey, do you like kimchi? If they agree, then I'd be happy to move with them. If they don't, I would not roommate with them. And, and that's my, my story. I've, I've, I've gone through that in the past. And then also um, some of my uh, roommate experiences, they've been Caucasian most of the time. And I would be the only Asian in the group. And I'm always the one cleaning, always the one cleaning every day. And the white roommates would complain, oh, you don't have to clean all the time. And they seemed, they seemed kind of irritated with me. You know, oh, these Asians got to clean all the time. Why does it have to be spick and span like that? And you must have OCD. And I said, no, that's not it at all. And then next, I like to watch uh, TV with the closed captioning on. And it's you know, mainly because I'm an international student. So I'm still trying to learn written English. And sometimes if I see a word that I don't understand, I'll ask my roommate, oh, I missed that word. What does that mean? And so sometimes if it would be a Korean American commentator, but they grew up in America and they may be talking something about Korea, but I could miss some of it because the captions move really quickly. And I asked them, what does it say? And they said, oh, 
Korean culture, you guys are so angry, just like you, you know, and gave me names of other people who were Korean. And those three people was, you know, Ohlone school, my Korean classmates. They say, all of you are the same. You're so angry. And I said, oh, hold on, excuse me. That's not only, Americans are angry too. There's people all over the world that have it, sometimes have attitudes, they have personal, pers personal issues. And I can see his, his, Hispanics and white people get just as angry. I don't think you can single out Asians or Koreans. I think you have misconceived this whole idea. And so having these white and American roommates Clearly, they look down on us, and that's a big struggle that I've been through. As an international student, we want to learn. We want to learn from Americans because Americans have so much more advantage. They have so much more privilege. They have educational opportunities that we don't have in other countries, especially in Asia. We don't have that level of opportunity like there is in America. It's amazing here. You can mental health, medical, educational. And those of us coming from Korea, we don't see enough of that. We don't have the access to getting the education in mental health or legal, social justice and criminal justice. Whew, there's so much. So much for me to say. I think I I'll just stop understand. here. <clears throat> I know this is, these moments are, you know, uh, very emotional and things uh, sometimes were triggered. Once again, you know, this is your experience. The community, uh, so they can understand you. So this is true to your space to share your experience. And we truly, uh, we appreciate you opening up. I know it's not easy to be so right. um, transparent. So if um, there's no other question, I would like to go ahead and have a break and see you, Jenny, did you, were you going to say something? No. Okay. So we'll go ahead and have a break. We'll just do a few seconds. And then what we'll do is we'll open to um, Q&A after the break. Okay. So we'll turn everything off and just have a short break.
waiting for the other interpreter to appear on screen. Welcome back again. Uh, we had a little breath of fresh air, and now we have some questions. So I'll go ahead and um, find the first question, and this is from Sinju Engineer. Sinju. So in public schools, in deaf schools, Asian students often have unique names. How do you make the teachers be respectful to the students of their unique individual names? So their full, well, their full name must be spelled. And how do we make this happen? How do we wear, raise awareness? Of, so those students have their identity, what their identity is. How do we really improve empathy and compassion for those students? Anyone would like to respond? If so, raise your hand. Yes, Jan. This is Jan. I think this question totally aligns with my college experience. I teach at CUCLA as an ASL professor I have about three quarters of Asian students mixed into my class. And on the first day, their names can be quite complicated. And many of them don't know sign language. I do have an interpreter. So I do ask, uh, what would, what, how do you spell your name? And if it's an odd name, it may not be something that I can pronounce. I will ask the student if they could voice their name out loud. And I would uh, try to get that uh, correct. And then I'll also ask if they go by a nickname because a lot of Asian students do prefer using a nickname, which makes it a lot easier. But I really don't mind either way, whether it's their given name or their nickname. Um, many of the students who um, are not Asian will say, well, can you please say, hey, you, you know, use your first name, but I have every student say their name aloud for everybody else to hear. And if they do, they get points for this, you know, and they didn't know they were going to get it until after the activity was over. And from there on, if they get the names correct, they get points for that because I really want to emphasize respect. And that's what I do in my classroom. And not only for the Asian, you have some African-American names, some Hispanic names that are unusual. And again, it's a team effort and everybody's name is very crucial to their identity. I want everybody to feel inspired. So every semester I do this activity. Oh, that is a great idea to really motivate the students to earn those points. How inspirational is that? Any of you want to talk about how, you know, teachers can respect the students? Any other recommendations? Yes, Jenny. So I graduated from the deaf school and there was a few Asian students there. So this is one example. My married name, well, before my maiden name was Paja. And some hearing teachers would listen to it. They go, pa ja, they would mispronounce it. And I would say, no, it's pa ja. And it seemed like some teachers would really, they'd have to spell it again and again to get it. Jenny, pa ja was my name, is my name. And so eventually they got used to it at the deaf school. But then when I, in the workplace or, you know, I was a pair uh, assistant and there was many people I would say people of various um, different races and you know, some people from Mexico, African-American, Caucasian, Asian, people would come in. And my years there, you know, in the mainstream school, I would see maybe one or two, you know, per year that would come through. And I noticed that their names were different. At that time, the teacher would try to finger spell the name and the teacher would, but the student would say, it would maybe not memorize the, the names. So as assistant, I would say, um, look, look at, the, um, look at the whole entire name. So look at this part of the name, the first name, and then look at the last name. And it, the last name may be unique, you know, the last part of the name, but that's, you know, in Asia. 
in Phil maybe the Philippines has a particular unique names or you know in China they have their own names or common to that country. And so sometimes students will go, oh gosh, you know, I don't want to remember all the last names that I do. No, no, you know, you must learn how to spell the last names. So, you know, here, let me help you memorize it. We'll repeat it. Um, so about three years, and I was in middle school, we did this repeatedly until we memorized those names. And I'd see the same students that they would then go from this class and they would advance to the next class. So maybe like in sixth grade, we repeat these names again and again. So by the time they get to seventh grade, they memorize people in sixth grade, these Asian students' names. And then by the time they get to eighth grade, then they, you know, I keep emphasizing how important it is to know the name because it shows it's a sign of respect. And I'd say, do you remember my last name? And they look at my name, you, you, my name looks like a white person's name. But I said, no, my Filipino name is this, and this is the Asian part. And they go, well, you're Filipina? And I said, yes, I am. But this is my last name. They go, "That's your last name is not Asian. I said, yes, it's true, because I married, my married name is American. But the rep re repeating and studying again and again a name and memorizing it, I think is a sign of respect. Okay, one half. I agree with what Jenny's saying. I just want to add a little to that. As far as a name goes, there's so many different Asians with very different names and there's Chinese and Japanese, Korean, and they could be hard because there's some that overlap. You have Parks and Chings in more than one ethnicity. After moving to America, they're just all immigrants. And I think in my opinion, we need to be able to respect those students and honor whatever their wishes are. And the rationale I have behind that is if a student say, for example, my name is Wong Ha, and I say, my name is Wong Ha, I tell that to the teacher and they may struggle to pronounce it. I feel like that's no respect to me and who I am if they're not going to pronounce my name. We all live here, we are all human beings and every person is precious and you have to respect respect their names, their pronouns, their sex, their age, their religion. In, in all areas, you need to respect the person's life, all lives, which means you need to respect anybody's wishes and just re-emphasize over and over, yes, this is a matter of respect and just keep practicing and not say, oh, well, this is too hard. We need to come up with something else. That's unacceptable. Yes, I'm sure. Not only, you know, Asian names, but also uh, Hispanic or Jewish, you know, German names. They, some of those German names are much really long. So you have to learn how to spell it. And again, it's a sign of respect. Yes. That person has their own name, their uniqueness. And I totally agree with you. I'm glad that you brought that up. It's nice to bring up this subject and share these ideas. So, oh, hold on. yes, Sarita. Yes, I would say I agree with everybody what everyone else has said, and I'd like to add that sometimes you have, you know you have pictures um, with the names, and if you see them, you can repeat them, and maybe the teacher could you know ask the parents how do you pronounce this name? Well, that's a good idea because um, sometimes children don't know how to pronounce the names, so you can ask the parents, and so those are some other options. I agree. Uh, parents oftentimes because they're the ones who gave the names to the child, so they wouldn't know how to pronounce it. Absolutely. Right. But transversely, what if the parents are deaf and they have a child and parents don't know how to pronounce it? Well, maybe a relative, maybe a grandma. Ah, grandpa, grandpa, very auntie. good idea. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. One well, in my, opinion. in my opinion, here in America, you know, it's not about just getting together Americans exclusively. It's about immigrants. We're all immigrants. Everybody has come here from somewhere else. And that was the whole concept of, of the American dream. America means immigrants and you automatically need to respect all races. Very true. I have another question from you and this is from Susan. Um, I missed the last name. This person is very curious about how many of you 
how many school days are in a week in, in your respective countries? You know, because in Japan, I've heard that they attend school for six days a week, including Saturday. So what about your countries? Yes. Uh -huh. So when I was in uh, Korea and middle school and elementary school, I, all the way to high school for 12 years, I had to go Monday through Saturday. So uh, yes, yeah, six days a week. And we would get down to about five or six at night. We'd go you know, join clubs and then Saturday you did go attend school. Sunday was the only day you had off. Now they have reduced that number and they've excluded Saturday and they only go Monday through Friday. So that's the current schedule. So Saturday is not included. Now in Japan, I'm not sure. Yes, Jan? This is Jan. In my country of Hong Kong, uh, they do still have school on Saturdays. It has been that way for a very long time. So in the mornings, they separate the boys and the girls. So the boys would go and uh, do something similar to military school. It's, it's uh, calisthenics. They have dancing. If you've seen on YouTube, they, they do physical exercise. While the girls, they do their own dancing. And then when that's done, they put all the students together. But they have to stand in line and um, go through attendance and so forth. They clean, they do preparations of the tables and so forth. Um, it's a very hands-on approach. And then once that's done, they do homework. The students have to work in collaboration to do homework like in pods. And the teacher just gives them a prompt and that encourages teamwork. If the student does not get involved, there is some type of punishment, whether they have to stand in the corner for 15 minutes as wow. a level of discipline. When the homework gets done, the students will go and prepare their lunches they share the meal together, they cook, and that's something that they learn. And then at night, they continue doing homework. And then after school, they don't go home. They get into their sports regimen. And it's mandatory. You have to exercise, whether it's baseball or soccer. And it's, again, uh, academics and teamwork. And the school system believes that you can get, if you get better in sports, it will increase your memory, your mind will be exercised as well. So sports is very, very uh, crucial in becoming a better student. And that's the mindset of their educational system. I wish America would adopt that to have students more active rather than playing video games the way that they do. Sports is a lot of fun. It allows camaraderie. And I wish we were seeing something similar in America. I totally agree with you. Yes, Sarita. A long time ago, my school, we would go Monday through Friday. And I think it was like 8.30 to 3 or 3.30. Sometimes you stay longer, you know, for a dance class. And I remember, um, yeah, actually, it could be Sarita's just mom, mom teaching us. Yeah. But anyway, during the weekend, like Saturdays, not every Saturday, but some Saturdays, you'd have science, you know, chemistry, you know, and the, the, my school is very small. I would say maybe five or six rooms. That was about it. So that was during my time. And then we would do science, chemistry, and it was only two or three students. My class was only two of us. Then... When you got near high school, you had to do entrance exams and you had to study. So you would come every Saturday to prepare for those entrance exams and you had to get, catch up for, you know, and prepare and so forth, so forth. So I don't know right what's happening currently, if Saturday is included or not. I left 37 years ago, so things may have changed. Right, that's true. I have visited India uh, went last uh, year in 2020, just before COVID, and I did go visit the school. I asked questions. I asked if they still have class Monday through Fridays, and they said yes, no classes on Saturdays and Sundays. However, they did offer extracurricular activities, like we had dancing and 
uh, a few other things, but now it seems like they only offer PE. So there's a lot of changes that have happened over the years. Um, and like Jan says, everybody has shifted to electronics as their hobby of choice. So maybe the idea of having school on Saturdays perhaps wouldn't be hurtful to the kids. That's something that would be useful. Jenny? I've had I, the same experience as many of you. I moved here as a young child, so I don't have that comparison. I do remember flying to the Philippines a few years ago, oh, four years ago in 2016. And um, I went to my parents' home country in their little bitty town where they're from. Um, it's not a big city like Manila. Uh, Manila, you know, they have really good schools there. Um, and uh, so we traveled to their town and it was really difficult to find um, any, any school for the deaf. I mean, thank goodness for technology that, um, you know, that's available, but the Wi-Fi there is kind of sketchy. So I did find three Filipinos in my parents' hometown, I was able to ask questions about what their week looked like, how did they do school, and they had classes Monday through Fridays, and their class hours were eight to about three or four o'clock, and so I asked what they did throughout the day. So they did have some basic chores. Um, whenever they finished the actual academics, they had to clean. They swept and mopped and whatnot. Um, what they shared with me was that they were really, really determined to move to America. And I couldn't understand why. I thought, hmm, maybe they should appreciate where they're at because, you know, the kids in America, they don't clean. They throw the trash in their desks or under their desks. But perhaps they don't, they don't know what the experience is in being in a big school like in Manila. So they don't have that reference point. I just learned from those three students. Very so true. this is Kavita. So nowadays you're seeing many changes happening in the educational system. Um, you know, and I think it impacts all grade levels, including post-secondary, regardless of the school size. I think it's important that the kids are getting an education. So moving on to the next question, um, that's from Sinju or earlier. So this is tied with his original question. What can a community do to make the community feel safe? What can be done? And the reason for this question is because LGBTQ students are called names on a regular basis, they're harassed, they're bullied in the school system. And oftentimes they end up skipping school because they don't feel safe. They don't wanna attend school on campus any longer. So how can the community be feel safer so that they want to attend school? How can we make it a safer environment? This is Jan. Um, in the deaf schools, yes, there are several students that are Asian. They're also identified as LGBTQ. And I always watch students, the students by language during class. So, you know, a large class and, you know, it's a safe environment. Then it's really my responsibility to make sure it's a safe environment. And so what I noticed, I noticed like three students would attend class, but I had a feeling that their energy, there was something it was something that was a little off. So I contacted the students per, by email and asked them kind of what was happening, checking in with them. I didn't want them to be afraid. I just wanted to chat with them. And I said, you know what, I'll take care of it. I didn't mention any names. I assured them that your name wouldn't be mentioned, but I would take responsibility. So the next week I addressed the whole class and we had a serious discussion. I said, so first I opened up with this, here's um, a contract. We do not bully. If you bully, then I will ask you to leave class immediately. And you, I have zero tolerance in my classroom for bullying. 
So this is my class and this is a violation if you do this. So I said, please, if you ever feel uncomfortable, do not feel, don't threaten the students, don't make fun of somebody because of, of, of anything for any reason. Come to me immediately if you ever feel threatened or feel uncomfortable, don't, don't keep it to yourself because it's my job to make sure everybody's safe. And so that was the tone I sent as a teacher. And I think it was really important to have lead, be a good role at, model as an Asian person. You know, saving face, let's put that aside. That is, just, is not, is immaterial. You know, I said, come, you know, let's be open about this, please. I can help. I need to know what's going on so we can make improvements in the classroom. So it can be a safe place. And that was my goal. Thank you. Then since you said thank you for um, giving that clear explanation and sharing, anyone else want to mention uh, something? If not, we'll go on to another question because we have other questions on the list. So the next question is from Lindsay Dunn. What would you recommend, or what would your recommend, recommendations be to um, us Americans as individuals, as well as in school, educational institutions to protect Asians against discrimination, against hate crimes? And what are your recommendations? This is yeah, Jenny. Jenny. Well, I think we need to start having that conversation with the group at a deaf school or any, any group. It could start by a simple question. Just ask, what can I do? What can we do to, I think that's where I feel like allyship could begin. Similarly, if, I become an ally. I try to understand the history. I try to continue having a dialogue. So I think my, my recommendation in order to prevent the abuse and discrimination or hatred, and if I'm looking towards allyship and we, we both want to have that allyship, why not just do it? I don't, I don't see a reason to prevent that by saving face. Stand up, get in the front lines, move forward. That's my, that's my perspective. Thanks, Jan. I also would like to just speak back and add one thing. I believe it's true that we, you know, allies are important in the community. You know, the, it's also a, a, to challenge people to maybe write books and exchange materials without names, or you could agree to share names and just, you know, write a personal, you know, use your voice, maybe partner up with students and they get points for that. And then they are vulnerable and, and maybe really high points. So that, that would be a successful relationship. If they journal and they exchange those journals and they, you know, share their inter feelings um, amongst themselves, they get to know each other. And it's really important this word of getting to know each other. If we do not, you know, then assumptions are dangerous. And of course the allyship would be killed. So we want to stay away from that. We want to stay away from assumptions and we want to instead do the other. I agree. I agree. This is Sarita, I have a brief comment. Uh, allyship is crucial, very important. I think you should invite people to come over, have a conversation, share your culture, give them the exposure, uh, have them attend presentations, um, expose them to the diversity. I do believe that that's a, a good idea if there's a conference or a club, have them get involved. I think, and also go to learn about who they are and where, they're, where they come from. I think it's that, uh, equal appreciation for each other. Jenny, if I could just add to this, I, I can have conferences and so forth, but we also have to really keep in mind, you know, maybe attend other people's uh, restaurants, you know, maybe um, go to eat some soul food or, you know, a different ethnic group, their food, you know, Indian, try different cuisine. 
become more empathetic, both inside and outside, uh, which will be strong allies. And, and I love food. I'm always very curious about um, other countries' food. So that would be a recommendation I'd like to add. Very true. I also wanted to input something here about putting it into your curriculum, putting it into a curriculum, including the history and culture, ethnicity, into the studies in all schools and colleges, middle schools, elementary schools, exposure, even through high school. I think that's something that needs to be put totally into agree. the curriculum all the way around. So number two, um, the same person, Lindsay Dunn submitted this question who says, what role do you think Asians can play in advocating for Black Lives Matter movement and the murders that have happened thus far of deaf people of black people by the police and the systematic discrimination that we see. So how can you as Asians participate in the movement and what role do you play in this? As I said before, I seem to have this favorite word and like to say ally. Use ally from the very beginning to forever, you know, until you die. The black community, what they want me to do, then I'm there for them. I'm there to protest, do the protest with them, stand side by side. They want me to make posts. I would make posts for them. I learn. So I believe that really, just as I said, you keep that ally in your mind and that's what drives you. Yes, Jan. Also, I, also like I want to invite guest speakers who happen to have experience to maybe being black and Asian, maybe as a married couple, having them come together and having a discussion and sharing their experiences and what their challenges have been, have them come and give their stories so that my students will be able to learn from them. How do they cooperate and have this marriage um, become the example rather than it being volatile and showing how it can work out in a positive way? I totally agree. So number three, um, before we run out of time. Oh, I wanted to say something, one has saying. So hearing Asian, you know, we're talking about Afro, uh, Afro-Americophobia or anti-Blackness that is uh, within the Asian community. Is that prevalent in the deaf community, Asian community as well? just like the hearing community? Yes, Jenny. I think it goes both ways. If Asian people do not know about African-American culture and norms, if, if you don't understand, then it, it's pointless. In the same way, if Black people don't understand about Asians and their norms and culture. So for example, if you have a Black group of people, you know, having them learn the history of Asian struggles and successes and vice versa, that the Asians should become more knowledgeable about Black history and their struggles and successes, that if nobody learns the history, nobody has these open discussions, Everything's going to be based on misunderstandings and assumptions. That's my thought. Have you, anyone else have thoughts? Sita and then Wuhan. One, uh, hello. Yes, go ahead. In my opinion, just um, last year, the BLM I apologize, I misspelled that as, BL, as the BLM. That was a very hot and sensitive topic and movement. 
then we had coronavirus that has really started some thoughts. And I've been thinking a lot about this um, topic and I feel that, you know, in America, there is discrimination. And I feel I can have empathy towards the African-American uh, community. Then COVID, once it's all over and settled, then I, I plan, you know, my uh, community, my the Asian Deaf Com Association, BADA, BADA, the president, um, the Black Association, uh, and the Asian Association are planning to have a gathering together to exchange cultures, so to speak, to have um, show mutual respect and, and establish an allyship between the two communities. I also want to share my thoughts. I think it's about starting the conversation. We have to. We have to start it. I know a lot of people dislike confrontation and they have a tendency to avoid this discomfort, but I think it's very important to sit together, invite them to dinner or have a cup of coffee and have a discussion. I think the hearing world has already begun this. So I think we as deaf people should also consider this approach as well. Um, we have run out of time. We do have one last question, but unfortunately we are out of time. Perhaps you can respond in an email or on Facebook. Uh, you can post your response to the last question. Uh, I want to take the moment to thank all of you who have come to watch our stream. I want to thank the panel. I want to thank the audience for these outstanding questions. I want to thank the two interpreters that are on the call. And I want the people behind the scenes to show their faces just for a moment so we can recognize them and their work. So please come up on screen. Let's see everybody. Hand waves, very good. Ashada, where are you? I want to thank all of you for doing all the work, even though we don't see it, working on monitoring YouTube and Facebook and all of the tech that's been going on. I know that Jermaine's been responsible for that. But most of all, I want to thank the interpreters, Jenny Blake and Sabina Wilford. They've uh, been here with us tonight doing a great job. I want to thank all of you for joining us. Stay healthy. Remember, as we leave this meeting, start the dialogue, talk with your friends. This is something we can do in starting that allyship. So please keep that in mind. Have a great evening.